Welcome to the Revolution Church Podcast. Before we begin, we'd like to remind you that our ministry is supported 100% by listeners like you. To make your 100% tax-deductible donation today, please visit revolutionchurch.com slash donate. You can also learn more by clicking the donate section on the website. Well, hello, and welcome to Revolution Glad to have you here, as always. So I'm sure you've heard the good news. <laughs> and it's not that he has risen, but that we're moving to, uh, moving back to Bryant Lake Bowl, April 2nd at 11 a.m. So if you're in the Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota area, come by, say hello. Uh, we'll be there every Sunday at 11. Or maybe not every Sunday, but most Sundays. Sometimes they have events in the theater, and when they do, they give us a bowling alley. So that's actually the day to come, is just when you can bowl rather than have to worry about hearing me go on jibber-jabber. So today, I want to want to preach a happy sermon, but as you know, we don't do any happy sermons here. <laughs> um, that's something that Mike Ness used to say, you want to hear a happy song? We don't play no happy songs. Um, and obviously, my sermons are often a little bit macabre, but that's okay. Today's talk is going to come from a sermon that I've actually read before. Yes, someone else's sermon. And I thought, you know, I've read this sermon. It's somebody else's sermon. And now I'm going to do a sermon from another sermon. Can I do that? And then I remembered, oh, yes, I can. I can record it down and do whatever I want. And uh, if you like it, good. And if you don't, that's okay. We'll have something else for you next week. But uh, I wanted to talk to you uh, about... Uh, well, I'm going to use Paul Tillich's sermon, You Are Accepted, which I think is probably one of the finest sermons ever laid down on paper, uh, ever given, uh, from the book Shaking of the Foundations. So if you want more of that, you can also just type in You Are Accepted by Paul Tillich and, uh, in the old Google search engine, and it comes up for free. It's quite a, quite a book. I actually ended one of my books with part of the sermon. Um, I've read the sermon, so as you get it, when I like things, I use them frequently. Um, and so this is one of those ones that I like. But he's preaching on Romans 5.20, um, which is... But the law came in with the result that the trespass multiplied. But where sins increased, grace abounded all the more. So his version, when he was reading it, says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sins abound, grace did much more abound. And grace abounds. Now, the dude abides, grace abounds. Now, sin is the word we're using today. And I think we have made sin a taboo word, a four-letter word. It's only three letters. And treated it as something that, though it's, uh, well, I often make it plural, sins. Uh, we also often get into the management of these ideas. Um, the church often goes to extreme measures to punish people for their sins. Uh, another social distortion song, we're not punished for our sins, but by them, which I believe. <laughs> but I want to talk to you about uh, 
sin as despair or, or despair as sin rather than uh, well, we usually see it. And this is this is something that I think we need to it might require you to stretch a little bit, might require you to uh, rethink how we use the word sin. And it, it definitely has caused me to. Uh, lots of folks, especially folks like Paul Tillich um, and meeting Pete Rollins and people like that over the time has made me rethink it. I've always been open to rethinking it, but you know, continues to inform me and rethink things. But I'm going to read from the shakings of the foundation. Uh, here, Paul Tillich. We always remain in the power that from which we are estranged. The fact brings us to the ultimate depth of sin, separated and yet bound, estranged and yet belonging, destroyed and yet preserved. The state which is called despair. Despair means that there is no escape. Despair is the sickness unto death. I mean, destroyed and yet preserved. I mean, think about that. That is, to me, extremely powerful. We'll come back to that in a minute. But the terrible thing about the sickness of despair is that we cannot be released, not even through open or hidden suicide. For we all know that we are bound eternally and incapable of, to an inescapable to the ground of being. The abyss of separation is not always visible, but it has become more visible to our generation than the preceding generations. Because of our feelings of meaninglessness, emptiness, doubt, and cynicism, all expressions of despair of our separation from the roots of the meaning of our life, sin in its most profound sense, sin as despair, abounds amongst us. Where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. So let's look at this idea of what despair is sin, destroyed yet preserved. For me, I deal a lot with despair or depression. It's my dark passenger. You know, it's it's something that I have, it's the thorn in my flesh. You know, it's the thing that I've asked to be removed a million times. I go to a psychiatrist and counseling and you, know, you name it, I've, I've done it to try to get rid of it. <laughs> Yet it sticks with me. Uh, it seems to be an uncurable disease, unfortunately. But I don't give up. Not that easily. But it, it, it is it is an area where all sorts of things can just trigger it. Um, things like I forgot to renew my jbaker.com site and somebody bought it. <laughs> or a person bought it and is reselling it for a high price. I don't know what that is. Um, and I was disappointed because I I messed up. I missed the opportunity. I changed emails and didn't get the emails forwarded correctly. And I wasn't organized. And I became shame. Came into my life. And I get, I feel shame a lot. Shame is another area which the part of the depression that I deal with. Um, I wrote down a few things on, you know, that are examples, not just of mine, but of examples that we all have, uh, un, being unorganized is one for me, but things like we forget to fulfill a promise that we made. We fail at doing, you know, fulfilling our, our obligations, uh, Maybe you're like me and you're always late. I try not to be late, but it can be a thing. I'm absent-minded. I want to be a good dad. And I want to, you know, being an equal partner in your marriage. And there's things like this that sometimes we can't get 
a grasp on. And so we allow despair to come in because we might not be good or strong at certain things. Um, it's tax season, so maybe you end up owing taxes because you didn't take enough out, you know. And it causes pressure. And it causes you to stress out about it. You know, this is the type of thing that shame comes in and you go, oh, I should have, you know. And AA, they have the saying, don't should on yourself. Because <laughs> it's very easy to do that. And with shame or shitting, <laughs> uh, the sin of despair comes in. Now, this is why I think it's interesting about the grace abounds using the sin or sin abounds, grace abounds even more using that is because these are areas that we often don't think of as sin. And so we often don't think that grace is required for them or that we have grace in our mistakes. Like for some reason, I believe everyone should have grace. And if someone came to me and said, Jay, I'm worried because I'm, you know, I'm unorganized and I'm late and, oh, I forgot to renew my website and I just feel horrible and I'm a bad person and I have so much shame. And I would say, you know, it's a mistake. It happens. We all make mistakes. You know, it's easy to forget things. You know, you know, you have grace, you know, and, and, but sometimes we will, think that grace is for everyone but us, you know, or because we have sin categories, we think that it has to fall under some sort of sexual thing or some sort of like, oh, I told a lie or, you know what I mean? Rather than saying, you know, I need grace because I'm in despair. I need grace because I feel shamed. I need grace because I feel depressed. You know, I need grace because I'm a pastor who questions my belief in God at times. And feels great pressure from that. In the second part of the this book, and you are accepted. Paul Tillich talks a more a little bit more about grace, and I want to read that. Grace strikes us when we are in great pain and restlessness. It strikes us when we walk through the dark valley of meaninglessness and empty life. It strikes us when we feel that our separation is deeper than usual because we have violated another life, a life which we loved or from which we were estranged. It strikes us when our disgust for our own being, our indifference, our weakness, you hear that? Our weakness, our indifference. Think of, them, think of those things. But this is when grace, remember grace strikes us when. When our, when our disgust for our own being, our indifference, our weakness, our hostility, and our lack of direction and composure have become intolerable to us. It strikes us when year after year, the longed for perfection of life does not appear. When the old compulsions reign with us as they have for decades, when despair destroys all joy and courage. Now, I'm reading this to you because that's in a place that I'm at in my life right now. You know, I have a lot of despair. I have a lot of depression, but a lot of good things are happening too. And I'm, I'm really trying to find that balance in my life. And, and the other day, it was a moment in counseling where I realized I'm not receiving grace in these areas of my life for somehow grace isn't for me. And that's how I felt when I was a young teenager growing up that God had made a mistake. And somehow I was that mistake because I couldn't follow through certain things. And so I was bad. And, and that was the mistake God made me to be able to not follow God, to not be perfect, which then you realize one day no one's perfect. All sin, all fall short yet. God is gracious and kindness, declares us none guilty. Yada, yada, yada. But sometimes in that moment, um, hold on, before I read more, but, so that's a, 
that's an area where we often find ourselves when we're in, in despair in these areas of our lives where we have our weakness and our indifferences have gotten in the way and the old compulsions come back and we don't allow ourselves to have grace. I'm not reading. I'm just talking to you right now. And, and, and we don't even realize that that's an area where we need to have grace on ourselves. That is the hardest place sometimes to have grace. Somebody asked me why I preached so much grace once and I said, because I have the hardest time giving it. As I've gotten better over the years at giving grace, what I forget sometimes is that also I need grace. Somebody asked me, they said, well, don't you deserve grace? And I was like, well, you know, I don't deserve, you know, we don't deserve grace. We give given grace. Well, do you, don't you think everybody else deserves and gets grace? And I'm like, well, yeah, everybody gets grace and deserving or not. And, and I brought up this sermon here. I mean, this sermon shaking the foundations. Uh, I mean, you are accepted from shaking the foundations and uh, accepting that you're accepted. Uh, the idea of even that which is unacceptable being accepted. And I said, you know, that's what's great about it. And I said, well, then why don't you give grace to yourself? Why don't you allow yourself to feel that embrace? So what is that? I'm going to read on here in this book, uh, the sermon. Sometimes at the moment, a wave of light, sometimes at that moment, a wave of light breaks into our darkness that it is as though a voice were saying, you are accepted, you are accepted, accepted by that which is greater than you, in a name which you do not know. Do not ask for the name now, perhaps you will find it later. Do not try to do anything now, perhaps later you will do much. Do not seek for anything, do not perform anything, do not intend anything, simply accept the fact that you are accepted. It's easily said and it's easily written down. The name that I think I'm going to title this talk is Am I? Am I accepted? But just am I? You know, I was going to say am I Paul, but I figured everyone would think I was talking about Paul, St. Paul, or if I was actually St. Paul. Didn't want people thinking that was crazy. But it goes on to say, if that happens to us, we expect, Experience grace. After such an experience, we may not be better than before, and we may not believe more than before, but everything is transformed. And the moment of grace conquers sin, and reconciliation bridges the gulf of estrangement. And nothing is demanded of this experience, no religious or moral or intellectual preposition, nothing but acceptance. And I'm going to say right now, that's what I long for. I long for that in my own life, to really understand grace in those areas that to me have always seemed like gray areas but are definitely separation I've separated them so much that I've even put them in another category altogether that my faith doesn't play as big of a role there as it should or that I don't allow my favorite I, favorite theological idea and thought about grace come into that area in my life well, now I've realized that through having a conversation with someone, why am I not accepting grace for myself? Why do I rest my self-worth and the opinions of other people or allow other people to have that power over me that allows me to say, I'm just crap. You're right, I should have done this, I should have done that. The great thing about grace is it's not about what you've done or what you do to deserve it. It just is. And it comes in and it rains over you. It comes over you like a blanket. And I've experienced grace most of my life. I've preached about grace most of my life. And now I'm in a new part of my life and I'm really struggling to receive grace in those moments those little moments of shame. Shame seems to be a great enemy of grace. Despair seems to be a great enemy of grace to the point where it goes, oh, no, that's not even, despair will say, that's not even, I have, I have nothing against grace. Grace and me have nothing to do with one another. But I found that grace 
is required everywhere. Makes me think about that song from YouTube they did called Grace. Proceeds from Shame is one of the lyrics. And St. Bono is right. <laughs> it does, you know, grace and shame. Grace covers a multitude of sins. Grace abounds. Where shame abounds, grace abounds more. Where despair abounds, grace abounds more. And so when we have that loss of hope, may we find this grace. I'll read it again. As a wave of light breaks into darkness, and it is as though your voice you heard a voice saying, you are accepted, you are accepted, accepted by that which is greater than you, in a name which you do not know. But listen to that. You are accepted, you are accepted, accepted by that which is greater than you. That which is greater than you, that which is greater than you, the circumstances you're in, that's which is greater than the people and the opinions around you. So I ask you, do you feel destroyed yet preserved? Estranged yet belonging? I mean, that's what Paul Tillich is saying. Despair isn't that despair can be seen as sin. But the idea is, is that grace is what gives us. It's, it's the healing, the healing balm, the healing ointment. It's, 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 it's the acceptance that we are accepted. It's accepting the situation so that we may move on from the situation. You know, because at the time we may be doing the best we can and only by realizing and accepting those areas in our lives can we do better. It's a hard pill to swallow and it's a hard concept sometimes to grasp. And right now for me, it's more of a mental thing and I need it to be, I do need it to be to beyond that. I need it to be the ground of all being. I need to be at the spiritual moment. I wasn't going to read any more of the sermon, but I'll read uh, this one part that I've just looked at. The power of grace in our relation to ourselves. We experience moments in which we accept ourselves because we feel that we have been accepted by that which is greater than we. If only more such moments were given to us. For in such moments that makes us love our life, that makes us accept ourselves, not in our goodness and self-compliancy, but in our certainty of eternal meaning of our life. We cannot force ourselves to accept ourselves. We cannot compel anyone to accept themselves. But sometimes it happens that we receive the power and say yes to ourselves. That peace enters into us and makes us whole. The self-hate and the self-contempt disappear and our self is reunited with itself. So right now I hope that we're all able to find reunification with ourselves, that we are reunited with ourselves. That we can find the strength, the courage, the ability, the knowledge that we need to accept that we are accepted. I'm grateful that I had a wake-up call that someone was asking me, well, what would you say to someone in your church <laughs> if they were feeling the way you were feeling? And then all of a sudden I realize, oh, yes, I think I'm a special snowflake. Even if it's a, a shitty snowflake, I still think I'm a special snowflake because I'm somehow unworthy of love and compassion and grace. And other people may be giving it to me, but I'm not going to take it for myself Because I'm, I'm, you know, I know something that I'm, that I'm somehow different. Because I'm somehow, there's somehow an asterisk in, in when it comes to me and grace, and that's just not true. We all get grace. We all are accepted, even though we might not know it. I'm accepted even right now. I know I'm struggling to grasp that idea that I'm accepted by that which is greater than me. I am. 
And I want to share that with you because I want you to feel that and have that hope too and know that you're not alone there. And that we've got to stop allowing people to brand sin and turn it into something and then not allow the grace to come into areas in other lives that we need, like in despair and separation and these things. Maybe allowing sin to be something that we all do and we all have. It's separation, not listening to secular music. <laughs> oh, what a web the church has weaved through uh, time and tradition and bad theology. I'm going to pray real quick and we'll get out of here. Lord, I pray that you help us all uh, grasp the reality of acceptance. Grasp the reality that we belong and that we are okay and that we are loved. May we find that peace that passes understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. As always, thanks for listening. This is Revolution Church.